once they gave Are we ready, Andrea? Yeah. All right. We will reconvene now in open session for the uh, Amy Board of Education. Uh, first up is our consent agenda items. I have the consent agenda items for this month, so I will make a motion that we approve those items. <coughs> and a second. A second. Joe, all in favor say aye. 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 I have one community comment, so I'll read our rules and regulations here. These are the guidelines. Welcome to this meeting of the School District of Amory Board of Education. We are pleased that you're interested in the work of the school board. You may address the board only during community comments time on a board meeting agenda. Any resident, district employee, or guest invited by the board may make comments about any decision, policy, or board meeting agenda items. The following guidelines have been established for addressing the Amory Board of Education. For those wishing to speak before the board, a sign-up sheet will be available prior to the start of the meeting. If the topic noted on the sign-up sheet is deemed to be out of order, the presiding board member will inform the person wishing to speak prior to the start of the meeting. Community comments must pertain to a board decision, policy, or board meeting agenda item. Comment time is limited to five minutes per person. However, the time limit may be increased or decreased at the discretion of the presiding board member. Political speeches which are not materially related to board decisions, policies adopted by the board, or are not about a board meeting agenda item are strictly forbidden. Personal criticism of members of the Board of Education or employees of the school district are also strictly forbidden. Please stand to be recognized. After being recognized, state your name and the municipality where you live for the record. The board normally receives citizen input and does not respond or debate. If there is a need for an answer or response to a concern or issue, the district administrator or one of the other administrators will get back to you with a response. If your concern requires board action, it may be placed on the agenda of future board meeting. And we have one, and it's Fritz Coulter from, and do you want to talk? Vultures. Good evening. I was here last month talking about vultures, and so uh, I did go to the board book and I looked up the vouchers for the August. Uh, the August vouchers that you approved at last month's meeting. And there was just uh, three lines here I just wanted to talk about that sort of emphasizes the point that I was trying to make that there is a lack of transparency in how the money is spent by the district. On this one particular line, you have a gateway fee, $34.30. That's a line item. The next line item says checks for $266,196 and change. Doesn't tell you what it's for, it just checks. Followed by the next one, which is Clubhouse monthly fee of $99. Now to me it seems a little strange that you can have a line item for $34.30 and $99, but yet $266,000 is just plain checks. That to me does not show transparency. And that's all I wanted to point out. Thank you. And now we will go to our administrative reports. We got a new format here, sort of uh, follow the bouncing ball, and Josh is going to lead us off, I think. I'll keep you on task over there. <laughs> Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll keep an eye on Tom tonight to make sure he's. All right, um, so homecoming week, a uh, number of weeks ago, right after our last board meeting, great success. Kids had a blast. We had great weather, lots of fun activities. Um, but the following week was a much more exciting week when our football team had their legendary come-from-behind win at Somerset. 62-58 final score and one of the craziest things that I've ever been able to see. So pretty cool, and just our kids will be talking about that forever. So... Um, we did have our ACP conference um, night where we took our high school staff to Shell Lake to the Northwood Tech Health Center up there. And I just have to say, what an amazing center. If you guys ever get a chance to go up there and, and tour it yourself, it is a first-rate medical training facility. And the things that we saw that night that we're able to share with our kids are through the roof. Um, Mr. Enslin has already been trying hard to find grants to um, purchase uh, basically a huge machine um, used to, uh, it's kind of like a, a cadaver, but it's obviously all electronic and for anatomy classes. Uh, it's just 
the, the stuff that they had there, mannequins that played the role of patients, and they had someone in their control room behind glass that could change their heart rate, their breathing, all sorts of things for the nursing candidates, just all sorts of technology we didn't know existed. So we've been sharing that with our students. Um, we had our FFA Food for America Day a couple weeks ago. We had our optional PSAT test for those looking to get national merit recognition. Um, and I also wanted to point out that we have completed our uh, DOJ um, state required drills. The paperwork has been filed. Keith signed off on those. And I'll turn those, well, I've already turned them into the DOJ. So that portion is done. Um, upcoming events, well, actually, we had the big FFA um, corn maze and hay rides this past weekend. and. Lots of success, lots of fun there. I think um, we school. actually have some numbers. You want to rattle those numbers up, Cher? Yeah. We had a ton of participation. Um, I had kind of reached out to Derek today and asked for kind of a count. Uh, Keith was there <laughs> driving tractor, and I think Paula was also there driving that tractor is. for the kids that day. So we'd like to thank everybody who came out and supported that effort. There was a lot of other community members who... Uh, drove tractor for us. How many were we? At? Do we have six tractor drivers that day? Seven. Seven tractor drivers. So we couldn't have done that without those guys. Um, look, we like we had around 400 elementary students, 200 intermediate school students. Um, there, it was also run on fall festival. It looked like on Saturday we had around 600 uh, people participate. It was also a fundraiser for the FFA. Um, so I think some some money was raised to help support that program and we couldn't be more thankful for that so thanks to the community for Absolutely. for all of that that was amazing awesome um, we are nearing the end of our fall sports sports seasons we have um, two groups still going we have uh, Logan Dockendorf qualified as an individual qualifier for the boys con cross-country meet in Wisconsin Rapids this weekend and our girls cross-country team won the sectional championship on Saturday they avenged a loss earlier in the season to Osceola, and they were runners-up last year. So it was an exciting day for them, and they'll head down uh, as well on Saturday. And we have the end of our first term coming up in two weeks, so two weeks left till the end of the first term already. Okay. Don't skip right. Little Women. Yep. Oh, did I miss Little Women there? <laughs> yeah. Next weekend. <laughs> How did I miss that? It was on It's here. on there. You just, you just oh, it. Yes. <laughs> don't, don't tell Anna. I forgot to say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. November 3rd through 6th, Little Women, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday Productions. And they are working hard every single night getting ready for it. So and cool. I think you have your FFA students actually heading down to National Convention tomorrow. Okay, yep. all right. For another, for another round. So a lot of that money that was taken in for that helps support those trips, and we couldn't, <coughs> couldn't be happier about that. Okay, at the middle school, we uh, just recently started our second term. So, you know, most of our classes are, well, about half our classes are 12 week long trimester classes and some are six week classes. And so we're um, into second term already. Um, we had some trainings last week. Um, Joanne Erickson ran one of them and Kate Weisenbeck ran one. We did some peer tutor training, which um, has students that have volunteered to help tutor kids and um, subjects that they're um, maybe struggling in or could use some extra help and sometimes it just helps hearing from a friend up here that can help you worth some of that uh, we had a peer mediation training and that basically is um, training some kids that can help mediate out problems that other kids may have um, we use them on um, you know mostly minor things where there's some disagreements and they sit down and talk together and it really helps solve some problems um, the, the drama rama festival and that's a program for grades three through eight is in Osceola um, next uh, November 5th. So we're excited to um, get those kids. And, and there's some small group plays and there is a couple individual pr presentations. Um, those are usually um, little one act things that last about three to five minutes, but uh, they've been working hard. So it'd be nice to see them compete. Uh, boys basketball started today at the middle school um, we've had some PBIS meetings and stuff coming on. I put a lot of different things on here, but um, for those of you who don't know, PBIS basically talks about um, how to behave at school in an appropriate way to have positive behaviors. And um, we teach kids about respect and responsibility and safety. And so the tier one groups that you see are oftentimes working on um, 
lessons for kids and making sure that we're looking at our data. So if we see that there are significant problems with some behaviors out at lunchtime at this time, at this location, we track that so we know, okay, we need to intervene and get more supervision in this part of the school or uh, at this time of the day or on these types of topics or these are the things that we're seeing kids do so we need to make sure that we're discussing those expectations higher. And um, a tier two committee basically works on, um, after we look at the data, if there's some kids that are showing some significant um, behavior issues, then we talk about how we're going to address those kids individually with um, maybe some um, small groups or some support groups and things like that. Uh, our Warrior Way Assembly is coming up on Friday. And that's typically uh, something that happens about every six to eight weeks in most buildings and it's a celebration and ours is tied to kind of like the Halloween type of end of the harvest year and we're um, um, just celebrating with the kids on, on uh, behavioral goals and things that we've set for them. It's like an assembly, a, a lyceum. And um, let's see, what else do I have on there? Um, our project-based learning committee is coming up. So um, right now we're going to be talking about Genius Hour, but it's not just limited to Genius Hour. And so our, basically our project-based learning is trying to take what the kids are, the standards and the different things they're supposed to do and make sure that we have uh, hands-on project-based activities and as many classes as possible. But then Genius Hour is kind of our capstone piece where students are able to pick a passion, a passion project and just do a presentation or, or, or lead an activity on it. And uh, fall band concert coming up um, in November. And then finally, our eighth grade human growth and development presentation. Kids kind of call it Doctor Day, where the doctors come in. And there's a presentation for eighth graders. Um, invites went out to parents about that um, probably about a week and a half ago. Um, students are not allowed to go into that presentation without a signed um, statement from the parents saying that's OK. And, um, primarily um, taking a look at um, human growth and development with eighth graders. And um, that's a presentation that's sort of set up and lined up for us by the Human Growth Development Committee, which is a district-wide committee that talks about programming for the district. So that's kind of what we have at the middle school. Good evening. I'll start with HMH, inter-reading. So that's our newly adapted English language arts curriculum. So Paula and I have been working hard to provide opportunities for our K through five teachers. In late September, <clears throat> Teresa Stanley, who is a reading consultant from CESA 11, had come and had spent a half day with every K through five teacher, um, guiding them on the work and aligning it to our essential standards. Um, intermediate teachers participated in a virtual coaching session. It's a 30-minute session um, set up by HMH where we can ask them a variety of questions. Paula and I have another coaching session set up for our in-service day in November. So we're continuing to work on that professional development in our English language arts curriculum to support our teachers. Parent-teacher conferences took place October 3rd and 6th, and they went very well. Here at the intermediate school, we had about a 94% attendance rate, which is wonderful. We offer parent-teacher conferences in a variety of ways just to support parents. Uh, what's really important to us is that we connect with them, whether that be by phone. Of course, in person is always best, but we want to be able to work with parents. Um, thank you to our IPO. They provided um, a dinner for our staff, so I want to thank Aaron and the IPO for organizing <coughs> it for us. New teacher in-service classes. So um, teachers that are new to Amory School District participate in, a, in uh, a sequence of classes approximately once, once a month, and then they kind of tailor off a little bit. And those are led by the administrative team here, and they just range on a topic, range on a variety of topics just to help, our, help support our new teachers. Some of it's nuts and bolts of what we do here in Amory. Some of it is our initiatives like PBIS, PLCs, and TSS. Tom had talked a little bit about some PBIS. So here at the intermediate school, we had our first rally. Um, so they took, that took place on September 30th. A student answered, students answered a variety of questions, which led to a football activity for teachers. It was very exciting and engaging. Kids really enjoyed it. And then another thing Mr. Mylan Archek, our school counselor, counselor and I have begun to do is to do monthly kind of rewards with students. So. Last month, students could sign up to do a walk in the school forest with myself or Mr. M. And then this month, um, just actually last week, students could sign up to do a fall craft and activity with myself, which was the best part of my day. 
I want to thank the FFA. I know we talked about that at the beginning. Um, one day they had transported all of our third through fifth graders over to the high school to take part in a um, agriculture literacy and just leg educational leadership program. So I want to thank, thank the FFA for that, for our students. We've had a couple field trips already going on. So Montessori and AIM have already participated in a few, few field trips. AIM visited Crex Meadow State Wildlife Area and Montessori visited Fort Falavon. Fourth grade has also participated in a field trip that was to Z Orchard and I want to thank Bill and Z Orchard for sponsoring that trip for our students. And lastly, we had um, a Title I fall parent meeting. If you recall, last year we transitioned <coughs> to a school-wide title program. So one of the requirements of being a school-wide title program is that we offer parent meetings. So during our first parent-teacher evening, we offered um, a title-wide parent meeting at both schools. Mm -hmm. um, so parents had an opportunity to come and, and ask questions about our title-wide program. Some events that are coming up tomorrow night, we have AIM has a tree showcase. On the 28th, fifth grade has a virtual planetarium visit. IPO has their Halloween carnival, and we have our Halloween parade on the 31st. Um, we have vision screening here at the intermediate school, and then on November 10th, AIM has a field trip to the St. Croix Fish Hatchery in the Ice Age Trail segment. Good evening. Um, I just want to just add into what Jessica was saying about HMH. Our teachers are really kind of just diving right into the um, opportunities that they have had throughout the um, sorry throughout the Bill training Geary. sessions <laughs> throughout the training sessions that we've been offering and looking forward to some additional as Teresa Stanley will be coming back again and we will have another Q and A session so that will be great. Our parent teacher conferences. The teachers and parents had the opportunity to meet and talk on October 3rd and 6th. Our conferences were well attended with an average of 95%. Um, teachers were all enjoyed the meeting and talking with the family, so that's always great. Our Lean Elementary Book Fair happened during that same time. It started with our fall math night that we had in the parent teachers in the parent teacher conferences, and it was a successful fundraiser. So many thanks go out to those that attended and worked in those events. Um, second day of conferences, as Jessica mentioned, we had our Title I meeting that was led by our reading specialist, Carrie Shu. so we appreciate all of her hard work in putting that meeting together. Our field trips and activities that we've had is our students have been enjoying some great fall activities. For example, we had our fall math night held on September 29th. We had many families attend and play math games, take part in the book fair, and get a bag of goodies from Power Up. So that was a great night to see families in our building. September 30th was our homecoming celebration and students enjoying seeing all the entries in the parade and cheering on their, their warrior teams. They get really excited when they get to see all those high school kiddos dressed up in their uniforms and excited about their sports. Um, kindergarten students were able to visit the Amory Fire Hall on October 10th, enjoyed learning more from the firefighters presentation. And the second grade students enjoyed a trip to the Four Hands Holsteins Farm on October 13th, which was a great time held by all that, and the Four, Four Hands Holsteins has been welcoming their school for the last few years, and they just really enjoy seeing the kids as well. Kindergarten students also showed off their hard work during their ABC fashion show, which some of you probably had seen online. They do such a great job. Um, and October 19th, the Lean Elementary Schools had our fall building outing for the, at the FFA <coughs> corn maze. Um, and this was very, very well received from the students. They were really excited. They put together, the FFA students put together um, four different um, educational spots within that maze. So they learned about dairy and plants and um, and bees and it was just a really nice time kids were really excited um, this was an engaging activity and, and and it's great again to have the high school students involved with our young students our crisis committee continues to review and update our safety manual um, and run our safety drills throughout the year and fast bridge Lean Elementary School conducted their fast bridge on week of September 19th, so staff has gotten together and talked about the data and put um, in intervention groups together, and they continue to talk each week about how to best meet the needs of the students. 
a referendum, the Lean Elementary referendum, continues to work on and the design plans continue and, and we're just continuing to move forward with that. So we're getting excited now about our next steps. Upcoming events is our Halloween parade on October 31st. We have um, a no school for an in-service on the 7th. Our PBIS, our Positive Behavior Intervention and Support Celebrations, November 21st, and Thanksgiving vacation. Thank you. Busy. Yes. Yeah. All right, uh, pupil services report for this evening. Um, just an update on the transition readiness grant. Um, I reported that we're uh, recipients of um, some funding to support uh, the growth of vocational skills um, with uh, students at the high school. So we've been gun uh, case managers have begun identifying the potential students to participate in that program. And one of the first things that they would need to do on identifying those students are um, really finding out where they're at and where the gaps are and where they need to go next. So uh, to that end, we've already directed grant funds. Um, or earmark them to, to purchase the Brigant's transi Transition Skills Inventory, which is a, a fancy assessment including um, a lot of criterion-based references and um, measures some basic academic skills, post-secondary uh, training and skills, independent living, and community participation and engagement. So um, they can really have an opportunity um, to uh, find the right kind of baseline for what skills kids might need, where they want to go, and this is just another assessment. We certainly have other assessments to do this. This is another tool in our toolbox, so anytime that we give teachers another tool for them to use, um, we know that they're appreciative of that, of that and we also know it um, informs a better IEP and, and plan for their future, so we're excited about that. Um, Child Development Days feels like it was a, a year ago. It was just October 6th, but I, I, I looked back and, and really failed to report on that. So I just do want to um, reiterate that um, we screened um, about 25, 30 um, children um, and families participated in kind of going to different stations at the elementary school, um, screening in vision, hearing, developmental screenings and surveys and had the opportunity to connect with the Birth to Three Transition Services of Polk County. Um, so it had been a while since they had done that in the past, they participated with us in that, that night, um, but it had been a few years uh, um, since that happened. It was nice to see that collaboration. Um, there's just too many people to thank, but we get, I get a, put a few names. I know I'm gonna miss a, a bunch of others that helped out, but our early childhood teacher, Stephanie Crawford, who really helped lead this, Don Larson from Polk County Health, um, our nurse uh, Rose Kupker, uh, the Amory Lions Club did a lot of the vision screen, did deep vision screen, not a lot of it, they did it all, uh, the vision screening for us. So we really appreciated uh, that collaboration. And then a number of paraeducators, staff, Peggy Marson, Travis Bauermeister, Misty Wishard, our SLP Mackenzie Goodrow worked all night um, doing speech services and, and assessments. And of course the custodial staff, Rick Tilton did a lot of things to set up. So thank you for everybody. It's not a small undertaking. And also thanks to Annie Brayton because we're sharing space with the book fair. And so that's always, uh, um, it, it's, it's a busy time. So, um, but we feel like it worked out pretty well and um, we've got some good information to move forward with. Um, finally, trainings. Um, we had sent um, uh, teams of general ed and special ed teachers from three out of the four buildings to a classroom training at, at CESA um, and got some really good this is a, a, a speaker who's got a lot of experience effectively differentiating it so that we can more kids at different skill levels be in the same classroom and learning at high levels even though we may have you know different target outcomes for some that are more advanced um, we're still going to be able to um, with the right way of teaching and the right support in that classroom to address kids that are learning kind of at the advanced levels as well as kids that may be learning at a more basic level. Uh, finally, procedural compliance self-assessment that continues to go on. We've identified three different areas that we need to sort of work on as a staff in writing IEPs and evaluations. Um, we'll continue to reinforce um, those training to IEP workshops um, in the 
the months of October, December, March, and April. Um, we are submitting a kind of a plan that, that formalizes our, our, uh, our efforts to do that in those meetings um, on November 1st or prior to November 1st. Any questions? Yeah. The transition system assessment tool that you were talking about, um, is that specifically geared towards a certain grade levels or is that across all grade levels just depending on transition into the next um, phase of education or out into the workplace? How, how is that utilized across it, all? Yes, pretty much um, adolescence, right? It can be used even from middle school. It's, it's secondary assessment. Okay. Um, they do have, I believe they've got an elementary one too, Brigantz, but uh, yeah, um, it can be used both with students who are, um, you know, have more severe disabilities that are working at just their goals might be independent living in the community, I'm transitioning into a group home, I need support in, you know, going to the grocery store, doing basic uh, activities of daily living. Um, it goes from there all the way up into, um, you know, what do I need for skills for a job, accounting, um, would a certain sort of um, job that I'm thinking of doing be a good fit for me based on my skill levels that I currently have. So yeah, it's a pretty robust um, assessment. Um, come to the high school and look at it. They're excited to get them. Um, come in two huge binders and then there's also now a digital license. So those subscriptions have been distributed uh, to the high school teachers just today. Cool. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Anything from you, Sean? No, sir. All right. Then we're done with that. We'll go on to our informational items, and we'll welcome a summer school report, Laura. Yes. Well, we had a successful summer school. Do you want to come to the podium? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Got to hear you. I know you did. I was watching. But she doesn't want to, but she will. I yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we had a successful summer school this past year, and we already have some plans in place to make it happen again next year. Um, this past, if we go on to the next slide, um, this past year we provided learning opportunities for 1,309 kids. Um, that was our just in summer school programs, but it also included the orientation day, the first day of school. Um, we encourage academic growth for students entering 4K through 9th grade. Um, we also had a, an alternative learning opportunity at the high school for the first time since I have led summer school. We had 52 enrichment courses for students who have completed grades four K, or K through 8 and as you can see in a lot of these pictures, we had a lot of smiles and skills and friendships that came out of it. Looking ahead to next summer, um, in June, we would like to hold summer school um, for three weeks as we have done in the past, starting with June 12th. So that leaves one open week between the ending of regular school session and then on into summer school gives us some transition time so the dates are there for you swimming lessons we already have a reservation with the center in New Richmond and the uh, the swimming lessons in June will coordinate with weeks B and C the second two weeks of summer school um, in the afternoons from 1 o'clock to 2 30 so that will give kids programming from 8 o'clock in the morning through 2.30, they'll, re they'll return home um, to Amory at about 3 o'clock. In August, starting with July 31st, since that's a Monday date this year, um, we are proposing to have two weeks of summer school, providing both academic and enrichment classes during that time. And we also have swimming lessons reserved for uh, those two weeks in August as well in the afternoons. We were very glad to be able to get those times that worked well last year to have the swimming lessons in the afternoon. We did notice in um, preparing the DPI report um, and crunching all of the numbers, we did see that there were some interesting trends happening. Um, we served 41 more students than we did 
in the previous year, in 2021, and registrations remained steady, but in instructional uh, minutes did decrease in several different areas. And um, what we saw is that some attendance could be sporadic, or perhaps um, children would register, but then not fully attend. And so that did have an impact on our instructional minutes. And then if we look ahead to summer of 2023, there is a new director um, it, for the Aquatic Center at New Richmond that I worked with for the first time this summer. And previously, our billing had been according to attended lessons, but we found that we had um, quite a few people who had planned to come to swimming lessons and then either not fully attend their session or not attend their session. And it really impacted, uh, you know, they had hired a lot of teachers to meet the needs of students, but then we didn't have the, the attendance that we needed. And so we will no longer be able to have the billing that we did previously where kids, where we paid just for those attended lessons and cancellations and refunds won't be available through New Richmond. So for the first time in my leadership of summer school, we need to look at um, having a fee for swimming lessons to be able to cover it um, accurately. Did anyone have questions about summer school? Do we have any idea of what that fee will look like? Um, the, the per lesson fee has been really quite manageable, less than $5. Um, so I think that it will be quite reasonable. In an earlier meeting last week when we um, first met as leaders within the school to talk about summer school, Tracy Hendrickson did mention you know, um, if we if we do the registration through our school today, which is the um, registration software that we have, and we use credit cards, there is a credit card fee. So um, to cover that, we would just be billing for the exact cost of the lesson, and then just to cover that credit card fee. Um, so that wouldn't gouge into the budget of community ed. Um, according to DPI, uh, mandates for summer school, we would not be able to charge for transportation. So the school district would need to continue to cover that as we have in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Any other summer school questions? What I, I guess I'm wondering about those um, decreased minutes, you know, you were mentioning attendance being probably the issue. Um, I know that if parents pay a fee, sometimes they have a vested interest in making sure their students attend. Mm -hmm. And so although it's been very nice to have classes be free, is there the thought of having even a nominal fee so that parents have a vested interest in going to the classes that they've signed up for? We haven't, um, we haven't discussed that pointedly. Although um, with the DPI forms that I fill out at the end of each summer school session, there is a very intense form to cover fees, and there are a lot of rules um, regarding fees. The, everything needs to be, uh, it, everything has to be uh, very meticulously figured because parents can't be charged over the amount. It may be more tedious to do the paperwork for the fees than it is to just have it as is. But with paying an outside source like New Richmond for the center for the swimming lessons, I think we will need to do that um, to be able to continue the type of programming that we have. It would just really be nice if when people register, you know, yeah. we, we want those little people to show up. Part of, part of it is hard though because you're registering in March right. and then you don't always know exactly what your summer plans are going to look like and you say you know well I w this sounds fun I'd like to do this but then sometimes plans change in three months or four months before right. summer com comes so I just want to apologize for my part in that no personal darts <laughs> <laughs> this 
evening. But it, but it was <laughs> for, but it's not just for swimming though too. It's like because um, we signed Tor up for reading, but then he only gets two weeks of reading. But then Hunter Safety comes about, <laughs> and we, you know, we're Midwestern peoples, and we want <laughs> our kid to go to Hunter Safety. So we had actually double signed up on accident. So I apologize for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's yeah, not it's not changed. just for swimming. Yeah. You know, yeah. there was no. There's other things too. Yeah. It's and it's true. Change. I mean, really, like you you want to do these things, but then plans do change. I mean, and is it are they able to? Are parents still able to? You know, let you know that they're not going to be able to attend, and then I, you know sometimes you've said like there, maybe there's a waiting list, and somebody else could take that spot or. Um, early on, uh, we can make that happen, and that really works pretty well. Um, as it gets closer and closer to the date, that gets more difficult because those people on waiting lists have made other plans. Um, so that, that gets difficult to fill. And then, you know, also with, with last minute cancellations, particularly with classes that have a lot of materials that are purchased, the challenge is the materials have already been purchased. And so then, you know, we have a lot of leftover and that kind of thing. So, you know, I realized that, you know, humans humans make changes in their plans. It's, it's what we do. Um, and things come up with families and that's understandable too. But we're just seeing a little bit of a trend. So thank you for your time this Good. evening. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for what you do. And that brings us to a referendum update. We saw the first half of this presentation last time when we talked elementary. We're here this evening to talk high school. We had the same suspects here this evening doing the presentation. Troy and Gary, I'll turn it over to you. So we had a robust an all-inclusive presentation prepared for you tonight. <laughs> I sent it to somebody at the district office who responded that it was lengthy, engineering, and quite frankly, boring. And so she took artistic <laughs> license it wasn't to reduce it to so what was purely <laughs> relevant <laughs> to the conversation this evening. So if there are questions this evening um, regarding portions of the presentation, I will direct them to Becky, <laughs> I'm sure she's got in her slide deck those items that were eliminated from our presentation. But, uh, but <laughs> we have um, given to each of you a book um, about the, the uh, high school project. And I'm not going to go through it all other than to say that, um, that the project right now is on budget. It's something that continues to move right up until bid day. But, um, but for the most part, we have finished um, the last of the draft reviews with the state um, regarding code and things of that nature um, last week. We've got a couple of things that we'll need to update. Um, for example, um, the concern about snow load and increased snow loading um, because of changes in wind and, and so on and so forth that have increased the loading calculations. So we'll be going in and adding a little bit more structure um, around the existing gymnasium. Um, we need to address um, a couple of items with regard to rated walls and, and enclosure, but for the most part, everything is there. And so when you look at the presentation, I'm going to move around the side here. <laughs> I had my presentation memorized, but now there's another, so. Um, <laughs> at the high school, <laughs> we are still doing masonry repair work. And, uh, and so we're continuing to work on those drawings, including roof replacement. The roof is actually one of probably the most complicated pieces of this whole project. And the reason is because at the upper level, um, we have through wall flashing that comes out right above um, the top of the roof where the gym and the, and the auditorium kind of tie into that upper story. And so we have to think about how do we tie it all together so that we don't cover up those, um, those flashings and weeps. And so, um, so that is actually probably one of the most complicated parts of the entire project. We're replacing the ceilings, exterior doors, um, addressing classroom and wall issues. But at the end of the day, when you walk through, much of the money that's being spent on this project is for things that you're not going to see. Um, and if you want to see them, uh, I encourage you to come and schedule a tour with Gary. He'll he'd be more than happy to show you what amazing ductwork and electrical conduit lie above the ceiling, which are all being replaced. But, um, but going into the building and what it is that we're going to be accomplishing, 
um, hopefully you'll find it interesting, fascinating, and, uh, and for those in the public, um, all of those documents are being given to Tracy so that they will be posted to the district website. So the book that you have in front of you, along with the videos, will be available for everybody to look at um, over the course of the next few weeks. I touched a little bit on the code impacts, um, building finishes throughout the buildings, probably the biggest thing is just um, that face lift that starts to do away with the jip board, which is constantly being damaged. It needs to be patched, painted. Um, those are things that we're, uh, that we're addressing through more durable finishes. And then throughout the building, we're looking at um, working with George on grinding the floors so that instead of having the VCT tile, which is a constant maintenance for waxing and everything else, we'll be grinding and polishing the concrete. And right now we're just finishing the estimating where we'll be taking off enough of the, the kind of cream on top of the concrete so that we get some really nice aggregate to come through. There still will be cracks and things like that because it is structural, it is concrete, but uh, we have a lot more districts that are going to um, expose concrete on their floors because it is so much more economical and easy to maintain. Just as a review, the biggest areas that we're looking at uh, renovating are actually, if you look at the science suite, the science suite encompasses basically uh, this entire area now in terms of what we're doing and improving upon. The cafeteria and group collaboration spaces I think are really turning out nice. Um, but that was the lowest of the priorities because we had needs also in the vocational area um, and then also doing some improvements in the locker rooms with regard to indoor air quality and, and moisture and, and just improving ventilation in those spaces. When you look at, the, uh, when you look at what's being done, um, this is kind of an overview that we use for the code officials so that they understand how the building works, how it functions, because when this building was built to where we are today, the code has changed dramatically. And uh, probably the biggest challenge we have when we work with many of the buildings um, of this vintage is there's no fire suppression system. So it's either the cost of a fire suppression system or it's a constant negotiations with the state to say that we want to do this, but you have 10 times more exterior doors in the building for exiting than you need. So let's keep those in lieu of fire suppression. And so the constant negotiations back and forth are, are essentially almost complete. And so this kind of gives you an idea of those areas that are receiving um, some of the greatest renovations. And you can see here it's um, kind of the vocational area right here where we're doing a lot of work with the classroom, welding, things of that nature. The media center down here because we are now placing a portion of special ed inside that area. And so we're taking some time to renovate that. And then finally, expanding the renovations in, uh, in the science wing. And for people who weren't here for some of the other meetings, part of the reason why we're doing that is because of the fact that originally we had planned to do a small addition to house mechanical systems within the building. And, uh, and when we did that small addition, it was going to trigger um, an expense for fire suppression systems and things like that that we did not want to take on um, because we didn't have budgeted for all of that. Um, so we eliminated that addition, moved all those systems inside. That $2 million has then become the additional monies so that we could expand the scope in science and the cafeteria and uh, in media center areas. So that's kind of how we ended up at, to where we are. The safe and secure project, um, essentially when I go through um, and talk about safety and security, um, we spend a lot of time talking about how does it impact doors, frames, hardware? How do we evacuate the building? How do we go through lockdown? And this kind of gives you a brief overview of the conversations that we have internally when we start to look at how do we want to make sure that we control movement inside the building. And um, I spoke uh, two weeks ago to two groups, um, two different associations on, uh, on safe and secure. I've been invited to speak uh, a number of other places now um, because I spend a lot of time in this area. But, um, but the things that we want to do are at the high school level, not only think about how do we control an intruder that enters the building, but 95% plus of all the violence that happens in high schools happen for, with people who are already inside. It's not a threat from the outside, but it's a student who comes in that has a grudge or something like that. So a lot of the design work that I spend time doing is how do we impact everyday life in the school and think about bullying, think about how do we create those visual connections and those personal connections with students. And then if something does happen, how do we lock down the building to control movement and access of whoever's doing harm, 
but also we talked last time about the fact that at a high school, um, if something's going on, it's just student nature, it's people nature to go and flock to what's going on. The crowd just basically grows versus evacuating the building. So we want to be able to control it from both sides. And this kind of gives insight in terms of how we're trying to do that. Outside the building, there's some pavement replacement as well as um, sidewalk replacement and then also work at the loading dock. And those are the three areas on the outside of the building that we're really focused on. And uh, it's not a lot of work, but um, the loading deck the loading dock, for example, is pretty extensive when you look at how much is deteriorated. Um, there's, a, there's been a long-standing challenge with gophers in that area and what happens when those holes fill with water and then it freezes and heaves. Um, so that really is the bulk of what needs to be addressed on the site side of it, not, not including um, masonry. Mechanical rooms, um, basically you can see there, um, we're going to a whole new mechanical system, a whole new delivery methodology, so it requires new space to bring those units inside the building rather than having all the rooftop units. The areas in red are now the mechanical locations for, um, for units. Special education, so when we meet with folks and go through what is it your space is gonna look like, this is just one small example of to what detail we go into now um, given access and use of technology. So here in this small suite, which is located within the, uh, the corner of what is now the media center, you can see that there's a floor plan. There's a little isometrics that shows not only the furniture that we potentially see in that space, but also what's on all the walls. And so that gives you an idea of how does it feel? Because 20, 30 years ago when I started in this business, we drew everything on paper. And people would say, I have no idea what this looks like. And, and to go through and do a hand sketch of all of these spaces would just be uh, an incredible time consuming process. And now the computer allows us to do sketches like this as we communicate, talk to, and work with staff on what will their spaces look like, how will it function, and, uh, and how will they be using them. In the media center, um, this is the furniture layout. We actually just finished the last round of meetings today talking about how do we reuse the space that's available since we lost this corner um, how do we handle storage? How do we handle all the VR things that are going on in that space? Book storage, circulation desk. And so we finally reached a point where I think we're in agreement now, Josh, that everything is now included that um, <coughs> needs to be done inside that space. I know that she is you know, disappointed that her space is getting smaller. But uh, we also talked about the fact that there are a lot more opportunities around the building that didn't exist before for programs that used to happen inside the library that now can happen somewhere else. And that will continue to evolve because uh, as I go and do school work on, you know, all over, uh, I can tell you that education will continue to evolve. And the spaces that are on the opposite side of the building from science, we are um, history, social studies, um, language arts on the other side, that side will evolve as will maybe moving the, <coughs> the administration to the front door and all of those will continue to provide additional opportunities to support students, rethink what is the media center and other, other functions. So um, <coughs> we're gonna do a little, quick little video here of what that space looks like. Um, that, uh, that again is something that you can, you can easily do now with technology. So this is the, uh, one of the VR walls in the uh, media center with the circulation desk here. You can see the classroom in the back corner kind of tucked away behind the stacks with the opportunities for um, teaching and learning on that side. And then as we, uh, as we'll then pan to the left, you'll be able to see the VR opportunities that will be happening on that side uh, with the renovations that will be, uh, will be occurring there also. Now that classroom that we were just looking at, that is not though the special ed classroom, correct? Correct. Okay. That is correct. Yep. So that's yep. just an additional classroom now that's being added into the media center for other learning opportunities. If a teacher wants to say reserve that spot or something like that, that would require the, the, the space is already there. It's yeah. already used for that. It's set up. If you, it, it's just a little bit more organized. Okay. Like a, but that space is currently functioning that way. Okay. Yep. It's used from time to time for staff development. It's used for a variety of things. But now it's kind of being reorganized and kind of pulled together so that um, there's one dedicated space for that activity now. We get to see what Becky watches on YouTube all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or at least what they suggest. <laughs> 
social Thanks media site for too much of it. <laughs> <Yeah, I'm sorry. laughs> Uh, tech Ed, um, the redesign there is basically, um, you know, it is creating what is currently a classroom and a whole bunch of other smaller spaces, getting rid of some walls to create one larger learning area for classroom work, uh, and then span expanding the area um, with additional welding stations and, uh, and supplementing some newer equipment that are being brought in and replacing most of the electrical system that's in the area. Um, also outside uh, with the greenhouse repair, there's currently a wall that divides the egg classroom from kind of a back workroom area. That wall will be removed so it'll be one big space now instead of a whole bunch of smaller choppy spaces. And then across the hall to make way for the new mechanical system, um, just revamping what is a classroom and a few other um, smaller spaces to, to allow for what needs to work for function of program, uh, teaching and learning, um, with what needs to be done for mechanical and electrical systems. And then egg classroom, same thing. This is what we're doing for new casework and, uh, and new finishes and things of that nature. The science suite redesign um, is dramatically different than what we started <coughs> with. Originally, if you went and looked at the science rooms as they currently exist, we were gonna go in and basically just replace casework, replace floors, replace ceilings, and, uh, and give it a freshen up. And, uh, and because of the fact that we're not doing the addition that was referenced before, we were able to go in and totally rethink what is science, what it is that interests kids in science, as well as create an academic area for um, space for group work outside, or maybe it's for pullout, um, which can be used not only by the science department, but also for math. And so we've got math on this side, science on this side with this academic commons in the middle. All of it feeds out into it. Math rooms are actually a little bigger, I think, than what they've had in the past. Um, which they're excited about. And, uh, and so one of the things that I've been really working with our design team on is the fact that we really don't want science to feel like you're going to college, right? Um, if all students are gonna be there taking science, we want them to feel excited about science and say, I can actually do science because this is a place that isn't intimidating. It's a place that's welcoming. It's a place that feels like it's um, geared towards their generation. But at the same time, the science teachers had a very specific number of things they wanted to create or do in those spaces. And so as those two worlds collided, hopefully we were able to capture both, um, both of what we view should be done with science to appeal to students, but also do what the teachers wanted. So. so this is gonna be the new science suite. This is a glass wall separating science from this academic learning area. Um, there's also additional glass from math into this area. So if students are out there doing independent study work, small group work, there's always a visual connectedness there. She just turned them down for prom. <laughs> that's because he didn't have a big sign and a whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He so just did. He was like old school. We're gonna yeah. have to have a talk with the team. It's like maybe we need a little bit more pep there. And uh... <laughs> but again, kind of steering away now from the wood finishes and all of those things that says this is traditional lab space, and really trying to to, to think of it as a place that um, that is appealing to uh, to students and to. To, to kids to, to want to take this as a program and, and don't see it as that intimidating place that it's uh, that you know we oftentimes see when we go to high schools and colleges. It really does look um, brighter and just like a I guess if I was going in to learn somewhere with it was all dark and wood and depressing looking versus yeah. white and you know where you're alert and um, and easier to clean it's, and it uh, really looks like a nice exciting. Yeah, yeah it really looks like a nice area. Yeah. We, you know, we would love to do more exterior windows, but because of the budget, we really can't. And so one of the things that we're doing to really lighten it up and make it feel the way you described is by adding that glass that, that kind of breaks down the wall between the classroom and other spaces, as well as, you know, really use a lighter color palette. So a lot more whites, off whites, um, trimming it with the black and red for the school colors. And, uh, and like I said, really trying to freshen it up, expand it so that it, it um, it is an exciting space rather than just that. And that glass is like thick, right? I mean, it's not like 
Sure Push glass. somebody through air. <laughs> I'm sure George will cover it up with some dis, dis, uh, undestructive material in about four yeah. years. But, uh, <laughs> but it should be good. It should be good. It's, it's, uh, we do a lot of it now, a lot of it. So. And what does the uh, greenhouse on, in the science wing look like now? Is there? It's going to be completely restored. The doors will be, um, the doors, uh, there's two doors. Um, added to these two classrooms because these are the two teachers who would like to have access to the space. So we kind of ended up, the number of times we changed names here, um, we actually needed a, some sort of mapped diagram of how many times the names switch just based on what are the things that they wanted to be close to, have access to. And so that really led to who has access to the to the greenhouse and it is being totally restored outside and inside so. they've already started to brainstorm over some of the lesson ideas those teachers specifically that had access to it they're pretty excited about some opening some options up here so okay, good because right now it's just sitting there kind of not being utilized to its extent and i'd like to if we're going to put money into it i'd like to see that some plan of what that will be used they've, for they've talked about doing their own little mini aquaponics systems in there they're doing ecosystems associated with fresh water and biology so they're they are they are excited at okay. the same time they're also careful because they don't want to step on the toes of things that are going on in the ffa area as well so they're, they're yeah. trying to balance all that out yeah i get it so as you continue to think about your building right and you continue to evolve what this building can be you know just think of what what things could be done on the other side you know, with regard to um, language arts and, and those programs. And, and then what could also happen once you start thinking more broadly about distributing and, and kind of scattering special ed. Um, you know, there's some really wonderful, wonderful opportunities in the building that just kind of start with this one space. And then with the um, special ed, s some of that being moved into the media center, um, are we still utilizing the special ed classrooms that are in existence now then? And or have capability to expand those opportunities Josh down there? Josh can best answer that, but yes, in short form. Yeah, so the, the majority of our special ed room classrooms are staying as is. The area that works with the ID kids, um, which is the area between my office and the library, is where the, the air exchangers and all the mechanicals are going. And so specifically that core group is just moving kind of across the hall they'll still have access to their kitchen area to their laundry area for their life skills class and the proximity is close enough they can still make it all work okay the last area is then the learning commons so when you walk into the building currently you're confronted with the maze of lockers right and so what we're doing is the lockers are being eliminated so most of them aren't being used and uh, and so the few that we think would be utilized are being scattered throughout the building so that if students want a locker, they can ask and have a, a locker um, assigned to them. But that whole area, when you come into the building right here, those lockers will be removed and we'll be um, going through and refinishing all of the floors. And then this is the lowest priority on the want list, right? But this is what we think right now we can afford. And so right now it's an alternate. Um, and so bits and pieces might be sacrificed depending on where we come in on bid day because inflation still is inflation. Um, but, uh, but the one thing that we've, um, that we've all kind of conceded is beyond our budget is moving the dish area. So we would love to take and move the dish area somewhere else. And, uh, and I, the ideal location is actually right here. In the design, we've carved out that space so that in the future that dish area can be relocated so the plumbing and electricals and everything are kind of moved to that moved to that space to create that opportunity for you. But to pull it out and move it at this point, it's probably beyond the budget. But it is all set up so that if you want to down the road, that can be pulled out. And uh, the big thing that it does is it really opens up the space all the way through the building. But secondly, um, there's a real congestion that happens right here in front of the serving area. And so when you think about it and you stand and watch all of you folks get your lunch and stand in line and, and do all of that, it's how do we open that up so that it just doesn't feel like a pinch point and, uh, and it doesn't feel like um, folks are kind of falling all over each other as they try to meander their way through between going from one period to the next. And so um, the idea is that down the road, it would be wonderful if <coughs> the office could be moved to the front door then the media center would move where the admin is and then what would happen to the space that you see right now as commons 
all of this area could become space that is cafeteria, all of that space becomes area that is student support, all of that space becomes area that is pullout, it becomes area that is supplemental to the media center without sacrificing a lot of floor space to say that here's a program that has a lot of floor area, but oftentimes doesn't get used to the same utilization rate as many other spaces within. So that space <coughs> is changing dramatically. There's still a little tweaking I wanna do just because I think the team um, is maybe having a few too many pinch points on this area leading into the gymnasium. But uh, if you click on the little video, you can kind of see what we're looking at and have planned for that space um, you know, at this point. So this is coming through the doors from the auditorium entry now, and you're looking into um, where the locker area currently sits. Obviously looking all the way through um, to, the, uh, to the outside with the doors beyond, and this right here is the current dish return space. But a whole lot of different spaces, a whole lot of different opportunities in terms of student socialization spaces for before and after school, different opportunities for kids to work on group projects at lunch because oftentimes what we find is, you know, with, uh, with group projects, you might have a group of four partners and guess what? Tonight I've got football practice, you're working, this other person's doing this other activity and it's hard to find time to get together and so the media center um, becomes that other space as does the cafeteria and so it's hard to tell kids you can't just eat in this area when we know that they've got a lot to do and it's oftentimes their only downtime. But uh, trying to create space that says lots of things can happen, lots of things can go on, and it better serves and supports everything that goes on the building from the moment it opens to the moment it closes all year round. Um, if we think of it as one large socialization, cafeteria, extension of media center, special ed, and, uh, and so hopefully it's, it's a much better use of space than, than just being a locker room. I do see this as being a, a real plus too when we host tournaments here or we have game nights here that um, we have a lot of sometimes um, fundraising opportunities that piggyback off of those events. And Absolutely. it felt like sometimes that we've hosted those things and we haven't had a lot of room for people to sit and enjoy the food that they've gotten from the concession area or gotten from a fundraiser. This really does look like a, a really welcoming space for the community to come in for these community events that we have. And yep. um, as, we're, as we're thinking about this as a whole, not just, I mean, our school building is used for so many different things in the community and the community is paying for this. I really think that this is a, a driving point home for those people that are paying the taxes here that that's going to be a really nice comfortable space for them to be take part in the events of, of the community so yep. and again it's uh, it comes from just saying that okay we're gonna we're gonna sacrifice some space to bring the mechanical units inside so we have that two million dollars to spend and there's you know obviously some some people who are who are swallowing hard because their spaces are getting a little smaller and some people are elated because they're getting an awesome space but um, but at the end of the day this is the space that <coughs> that the public sees and uses more than any other. And so hap hopefully and happily, um, rather than having all the money spent just on everything above the ceiling, this is the one place that the public can see, the public can use, and, and it's available for a whole variety of programs all year round. So you're saying, you were saying that right now we don't have the money to move the dish room. And so this plan is based on moving the dish room. Um, nope, the dish room is actually right oh. behind. It here. still is. Okay. Yep, yep, okay. Yep. So this is the hope is just with the budget that we're working on right now is to have this kind of space. Correct. I know I have high schoolers that, you know, stay after school sometimes and, you know, are staying because of play practice and they say like there's no place there's no place to hang out. Like if if I can't find a teacher who'll let me into their room, there's no place for me to just sit and wait for a half an hour mm -hmm. other than maybe the cafeteria, but it's not, you know, yep. maybe a very comfortable place to sit. Yep. So yeah, a lot of times we roll those tables up and stuff at night it's, too. It's so. the most inefficient yeah. spot in the entire building, and yeah. Josh can speak to this too. It's 650 lockers, and probably 200 of them are used. They're sitting empty, eating up space. I mean, this is amazing compared to that. Yeah. And I, I will say, um, just because it, we don't, the community doesn't always hear all of our um, topics that we cover in committee meetings but we've had the safety and security meeting you've been part of those discussions and you know I've been an, um, in opposition 
of taking out our lockers strictly because of I've been a big proponent of doing away with backpacks in school uh, because of those threats but we've had those conversations revolving around there those options are going to exist no matter what we do um, and so looking at and I guess I just want this to be something that the community knows that we've discussed and that we've talked about um, when it comes to those kind of security issues and um, and how that relates to those those things and I guess um, in order to sacrifice something like this on the chance of the what ifs doesn't seem uh, fair to the taxpayers either so um, we've had those conversations so we have yep yep and you know there's there's a lengthy conversation that can be had about safe and secure um, you know I've uh, I've I've had people who agree with me and those who disagree with me and and obviously oftentimes it's who's who's buttering your bread right you know if you're selling something obviously you think you've got the most and bestest thing around um, but at the end of the day when you look at high schools there always is a need to guard the front door right um, but I'm doing high schools now where the, the front door is wide open and it's because of the fact that so much of the violence walks through the front door and is in the school um, you know once the doors are locked and uh, and so how do you guard against that and we do know based on my work around the country that it is more difficult for kids to conceal a weapon in a backpack um, with everything else that they're carrying around than to hide it in a locker and then go get it when they want it um, so you know there's always those things that you go back and forth on and, and you know even when I uh, talk I talk to the Metro um, folks over in Minneapolis the, the school superintendents a couple weeks ago um, the big rush is now the amount of violence that is happening actually isn't happening in the school it's happening on the sidewalk outside school and so how do you prevent that and, and what do you do about that and so um, it just um, it just bodes well to create space that kids <coughs> want to be in to create space that really thinks about bullying and making sure that kids feel safe no matter um, where they fall on on their accomplishments abilities or anything else um, that would that would heighten their concern but um, but you know, hopefully at the end of the day when we're done with this it'll be a it'll be a place that you know kids are really proud of we're putting technology out here so the concern is what you're gonna put technology out in a space that kids can ruin it well you know, it's they all have it in their hands so exactly yeah. they'll carry one of those exactly I mean. you know 25 years ago <laughs> I designed Royalton Elementary School and we ran the media center or the hall the main hallway to the cafeteria went through the media center and the librarian resigned after three months because kids were walking away with copies of Ranger Rick and so you know I opened my checkbook and said here's two hundred dollars for Ranger Rick because if kids want to read Ranger Ranger Rick God bless them right. and uh, and so the same thing here you know you've got to provide opportunity for kids to to do what they need to do if they're you know stuck here after school and and they need access to that technology and those resources you want it to be there and some kids are going to ruin it for others and you know you might be without a TV for a while but um, but at the end of the day you know you really want to create a place that people want to be and we want kids to feel like they want to be at school yeah I think we have TVs out there now right that wasn't there I mean five years ago. Yeah, ten, we, we primarily run it for, as a bulletin right. for putting up announcements and but it's birthday safe. Open. I mean, nobody's like thrown a tennis shoe through it yet or anything, right? No. So <laughs> not that I'm giving yeah, anybody yeah, ideas. Yeah. But, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, but I do. You know, this, the other thing that I think about when I look at this is that we talk about an inclusive environment for everybody, and we talk about <clears throat> how peers can come together and feel as part of a community. And even if you're staying in your own little pod of friends you're staying in that own little pod of friends or your like-minded people in a space maybe in that larger space but then you're surrounded by other types of people you're not just segregated off in a corner of the media center which i think we see happen quite a lot in there and then there or another place where they feel welcome but this way that they can be exposed to everything going around them and still feel part of that larger community even though they're in their own pod their little group of friends in in that larger part of the community and by taking out the lockers <laughs> i think it's probably going to eliminate a lot of lunch hazards of that a lot of work of seeing what kids are doing inside those those locker banks because we know a lot of things happen inside that that's a constant monitoring issue when things are wide open people are seeing what everybody's doing it makes it easier so 
one of the other things we talked about today even is with the safe and secure doors, you'll be able to lock the school down in a variety of ways so that if it's being used before or after, um, you're securing the school so that kids don't have access to places where they find time to get in trouble, right? right? And even though that this is a very, um, a very nice space, um, you know, we're eliminating all of those other temptations down the hallway and, uh, and hopefully providing useful functions for some of those. Areas. Yeah, make it an area you want to go, but we also need to train our kids when, when, when and if this ends up looking as beautiful as we want, they need to take ownership in it and they, they need to own this and, and take care of it. And, you know, I mean, if you walk through our high school right now, it is spotless in there. You know, our custodial staff is just doing a fabulous job. But the trickle-down effect I've seen you know, when I'm walking the halls, if there's kids ahead of me and they see something on the floor, I've seen multiple times where they're yep. picking it up, throwing it away. I'm like, that's right. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's, that's great. Yeah. Even when you look at some of these spaces, too, you know, there's opportunities to close things off, move walls, um, where you can do student council up here. Right, and you can close it off so that people can still see what's going on, but um, they can have those um, those activities out there as well. So um, we're excited about it. It's oh. a great combination of all the uh, conversations that we've had over the last two years. This wasn't yeah. something that was done in 30 seconds. So this no. has been a long time coming. I think we started no. this talk back in 2020, did we not? We did. January 2020, when we first it was did right the, before uh, COVID. Yep. yep. So this is. Over two, two we and we, and we couldn't there. build a new school. It wasn't an option for what yeah. it was going to cost. But we're these guys have put together a fabulous plan to to get the most for what we had available. Yeah, I hope the community really um, sees that their dollars. I think that you've come up with a really well laid out plan for this high school. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. There's also toilet upgrades. We can't forget about the bathrooms. Um, so we are improving. Uh, um, and cleaning up some of the tile work, uh, especially in the boys' bathrooms around urinals and things like that. So we're, we're getting that taken care of as well as um, redoing toilet partitions and things like that to kind of spruce it up. And then just interior finishes, going with a more durable palette, um, and then bringing in more texture um, just so that it doesn't seem so hard all the time, especially with the block walls. We don't want to paint block and we don't want to paint that nice brick because then it becomes a maintenance thing that happens year after year after year. So how do we add other things to the hallways, whether it's more light fixtures, something on the floor, um, that make it um, a, little bit, a little bit nicer, more pleasant, less hard to skate um, as you move up and down. And then I mentioned the roof. Um, enough said about that. It's a, it's a problem unto itself, but uh, we're getting to the point where we've got it almost all figured out. Um, and then this is just a brief summary of just all the systems that are being replaced inside the building. So. Timeline, um, this is Gary's, but... Uh, Want to talk quick? <laughs> Stand there. He's like, oh, what? I'm asleep, I'm taking a nap. He's done. Move it the wall. Tell the wall up. But, um, but yeah, we're just continuing to work hard to try to keep all the buildings on pace. Um, you know, and we've, uh, we're continuing to work on not only the two primary projects, but I spent part of my day at the bus garage today uh, because one of the buildings needs a lot of attention as well. So our, yeah, our plan would be to come back on the high school. We'll get the plans. We'll get the plans right before Thanksgiving, and then we'll bid it out that the uh, early part of December, get bids, and then we'll come at, right after the first of the year back to the board and with our with a packet for the high school. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, see that we can afford all the, the pretty pictures. Yeah. I have one question on, like, on page thirty-one. Um, you talked about it says masonry restoration needs uh, exist on majority of the exterior walls as budget allows priority will bank areas to be restored first. So that's that masonry. It's just gonna. I mean, let's just kind of see how much we can get done. Or the highest priority right now is the. Um, the upper volume of the gym, that which sits on top of the roof. Because we want to get all of that work done before we do the roof, because we don't ever want to see masons up there again um, working on top of what is a brand new roof. So that will be done complete and in total. Um, then there are two locations that are really, really bad. And that is this right here is really bad. And then the other spot is this over here by the loading dock. That needs a lot of attention as well. So 
Um, we do have the priorities, one, two, three. Um, uh, we, the reason why we're hedging a little bit on this building is because the middle school has a lot more than we anticipated. So we'll be spending a little bit more probably on the middle school, a little bit less on this building. And then the big, um, the big um, reconstruction for masonry is actually the intermediate main entry. So we are uh, essentially all but taking it all the way down to the structure and rebuilding it because um, right now uh, bricks are actually just falling apart and falling out of the wall. Um, so that all needs to be rebuilt. No, Becky, can you answer that one? I think I covered it better in my group. <laughs> yeah. One last shot. Uh, Troy, I'm going to let you know that phenomena with your uh, slideshow. <laughs> It's called being Beckyatized. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, it's right. the old she time. She Beckyatizes things for all of us. So it's yeah. a good deal. Yep. She saved us all from uh, from yeah. boredom. I guess. Engineering. <laughs> yeah, engineering. Yeah. I was disappointed, Becky. Though I didn't see any like cute little graphics, you know, like little pigs or. <laughs> no. Next time I want to see little fish out there in the. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. It's amazing how from one month to the next things change, right, Tom? Oh, man. Oh. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We get the last laugh, didn't we? <laughs> oh, sad. That's so sad. It's only Monday, dude. Take it easy. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. I'm not over the grieving process yet. <laughs> Any other questions? We'll expect you. I, I, Thank you. Right. I have one question. I noticed on this picture that this. This wall right here looks like that's where the restrooms are located. Are they still there? Uh, <laughs> high school front. Yes. Right, because it's. Yeah. Yep, yep, they're still there. Okay. Yeah, they just didn't draw all the detail of the existing okay. construction, so it's just one big one. Okay. So, all right, yeah. just curious about that. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Right. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Both of you. Thanks, both yeah. of you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for driving <laughs> out this way. <laughs> With that, we'll move to our action items. And the first up is our short-term borrowing approval. Okay, last month as part of the annual meeting, you approved the ability to short-term borrow if you wanted to do so for well past a decade toward, towards two decades in the month of October, you have short-term borrowed. And the reason that you do that is not because of a budgetary error, but because we don't get our aid from the state of Wisconsin until after the month of October. If we, we don't do a short-term borrow, we simply can't make payroll because of the flow of money from the state. Once we get our money from the state, we pay it right back. And we've been doing that for quite some time. I'm not sure if Twyla wanted to add anything to that, but that's unfortunately the timeline that doesn't work out very well. You're right. Okay. So if you wanted to do that, it's $2 million. We would need to have a, a motion to motion do that. I'll make a motion we approve the uh, short time short term borrowing for two million dollars. Okay, and a second? Second. Shar. All <coughs> those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Rondor next. The uh, budget levy and mill rate is all an end product of the annual meeting and the budget hearing that you uh, were part of last month and the budget hearing we walked through actually when in the annual meeting we walked through the five six page document that had the budget broken down the offshoot of that is the simplicity of the slides that you're about to see the first of which is the proposed property tax levy there are three columns here an audited version of 2021 an unaudited unaudited version of 21 22 and then a budgetary number for 22 23 the big difference that you see is in the far, old far right column underneath budget where it says referendum debt service fund. That's referendum debt that's new to the district. Obviously you pass a referendum, you have new referendum debt. The change in referendum debt service, when you put it into the revenue limit sheet, <coughs> results in a calculation of what this, this total school levy will be. And you'll see there it's a 10.768 million dollar budget levy or school school levy and you'll see the percentage increase from last year to this year that's the price of doing business when you pass a referendum on the next page 
you will see what the new mill rate is. The mill rate actually was projected when we met as a district and engaged with our public. We projected the mill rate to go from 7.98 to approximately 9.5, 9.6. It went down 7.72. Now you might be wondering, well, how do we levy when you do interest, 55, 60 million dollars, and then your mill rate, which is your rate of taxation, goes down. The next slide helps you understand that. When we did our budget forecast, we did not budget a 19% total property valuation increase in the school district of Amory. I, I've been doing this for four years in this capacity, 12 or longer than me. I don't think you ever budgeted 19%, and if you did, I would have wondered what you had for breakfast because that's some serious money. 16% statewide, 19% just in this area, compared to 9% in 21 and 7% in 20. The equalization aid from the state uh, is 9,024,994. That's also an increase of 8%. And then there's a hold harmless or a declining enrollment exemption, which gives you 514,000. So basically what in essence happened is we're getting more money from the state. When you get more money from the state, you ask less from your taxpayers. And that's what's happened here. And that's why our mill rate's gone down. What you're seeing across the middle board of conference, I just had a meeting with them. Uh, the the uh, district administrators from the Middle Border Conference, nearly every single one of the Middle Border Conference schools is under eight. Some are in the sixes, not with mill rate, because of what's happening with equalized value with property valuation. 19% is not a very accurate, in my mind, number, and it will likely come down in the future. What that looks like, I don't know. So, so that's the, go ahead. Sorry, so part of it is because we're getting more state aid mm -hmm. and is the why why is that I mean I guess I'm just trying to follow you know they've obviously talked about we've been getting less state aid because of of how the budget has been and they've been telling you use ESSER dollars to meet budget mm -hmm. so I guess I'm wondering how <coughs> we now are getting more well you get more and you're hold harmless that third bullet point there and then you're also getting more in equalized aid the best person to answer the increase in equalized aid would probably be you, Twyla, better than me. I don't know if I can any better, but the, the hold harmless increase is to help you when your enrollment goes down, you don't just lose one whole second grade, you lose students all over the place and that is to allow you to um, help you get to the next year when you can recognize it. So our um, enrollment actually decreased more than what they were projecting and so that hold harmless goes up. The hold harmless is part of the equalization calculation as to how much we get total. So that went up 9% over last year. Um, so that helped increase that amount too. The hold harmless was the biggest difference I saw when I was doing the revenue limit worksheet, um, even from what we were budgeting that would help cr increase what we're getting from the state. And then obviously the property valuation changes our numbers a lot also because that increases. Significantly, significantly so. So, and then is that just saying because people's property is being valued higher than they're going to... What actually happened, which was strange, is property values went astronomically high at 19%. But the state gave us more equalization aid. So basically what they told us was, I know your evaluation went up, but we're asking less from you anyway. And we're going to go ahead and give you more equalized aid. And the direct result, the offshoot of that is the whole harmless declining enrollment exemption is how that occurred, which is how our mill rate went down. So you would need to make a motion to approve that budget levy and mill rate. It's an action item. Do we have, so we don't have any idea of how this mill rate might look for next year. No idea. That would be impossible. But to I mean, we, we can, don't know our people count. We for can one. be excited about a low mill rate for this we year. We could. We don't know. We don't know what our uh, property valuation will be. We don't know what our equalization will be. We don't know what our people count will be. Those are the three biggest factors. Well, I'll make a motion that we approve the mill rate, budget levy and mill rate. All right. I'll second it. 
Motion to go second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. We're carried on. Now we'll go to Josh. Sure. Start college now. We have five students who are asking for permission to do the Start College Now program that, as you all remember, is actually part of a state program that you have to approve anyways. Yeah. Rum, rum, rum. Okay. Oh, yeah. well, it's starting straight. <laughs> yeah. I will make a motion. I've, I've, yeah, there. I've, I've, I was just going to say, let's just do this. That we uh, <laughs> will approve the uh, Start College Now and Early College Credit Program. And I'll second. second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. There we go. And now we got donations to the district. Okay, I'll run through those. The first of which is First Lutheran <coughs> Church. Thank you for the boxes of school supplies donated to Amory Intermediate School. The Nelson family, Julie Thomas, Greg Nelson, and Joel Nelson. Thank you for the donation of $300 to the, the High School Mental Health Collaborative. Z Orchard, thank you for paying for the cost of transportation for our fourth graders to take a field trip to your orchard. Am Reunited made a $50 donation to the Angel Fund from their lemonade stand. SMC, thank you for the many school supplies donated to the elementary school. Moms for Liberty made a donation of 100 pocket constitutions for our eighth grade civics students. East Emanuel, Thank you for the 260 goodie bags you provided for our staff to let them know they are appreciated. They look like Santa's workshop there for a while. Mm -hmm. And many thanks to our gener for our generous uh, community. Yes. Really nice. You're gonna make a motion? Yep, I will move to accept the donations with many, many, many thanks to yes. all. <coughs> and a second? I'll second. second. Or Dale will second. Dale. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 And opposed, no. It passes. All right. And now we have some personnel. Okay, personnel. We have new employment and extracurricular contracts for Ariane Hone for clubhouse assistant teacher, Catherine Sunderland, formerly Bartels. It's not a new person, just a married person. Uh, for the yearbook coordinator for elementary, intermediate, middle. Resignations, custodian Heidi Bloomer. Middle school cross country coach and assistant coach Sam Bosley and Alan Carlson, Sally Hanks in school nutrition, Irma Ledesma for clubhouse lead teacher, and Lydia Mara for clubhouse assistant teacher. And you would need to make a motion to approve those personnel moves. Can we have that motion? Yep, I'll make that motion. Aaron, and the second? Second. Char. All in favor say aye. 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 And opposed, no. There we go. So I want to know, this was, what What did you call this? Becky ties? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I kind of asked for this last meeting because, you know, it's, there's nothing on the board. And so I said, and I said, maybe they can do that. And she's like, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, Becky. No offense. <laughs> um, I had confidence in Jessica and Paula to clip art it up. But you guys, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's just kind of like, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Uh, and with that, uh, a motion to go into closed session, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercise responsibility in order to take personal action pursuant to Wisconsin statute 19.85 sub 1 C. So moved. Shar, second. Uh, second. Second. Yep. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. We're enclosed, and I thank you.